So uh, I'd like to begin by thanking uh, uh, the co colleagues at Northrop Grumman uh, who uh, participated in this work. Um, it's a great team at Northrop Grumman, um, and I have a lot of fun working there. And I'd also like to thank the uh, conference organizers um, you know, for uh, putting this together, as well as the staff. You want me to just use it? Yeah, sure. Like uh, Oprah or something. Here we go. Oh, yeah. Okay. All right. All right, and there, let's see here. Okay, so uh, let me tell you a little bit about Northrop Grumman. Um, we have a um, wor work in uh, superconducting electronics. Um, we have research efforts in uh, digital uh, superconducting logic, in particular uh, reciprocal quantum uh, RQL digital logic. Here's a chip of demonstrating that. Um, so we have device design, fabrication, and test all at our Baltimore uh, location, as well as uh, superconducting device theory. And in uh, Aurora, Colorado, we also have some uh, device theory as well as quantum error correction. And uh, we do work also on uh, adiabatic quantum optimization as well as uh, various design work in superconducting qubits. So I'd like to begin by uh, just kind of, uh, I don't want to get into an um, extensive uh, definition of all the different uh, uh, complexity classes, but uh, just to kind of touch on uh, the exciting moment that we find ourselves in as a community, where we are beginning to enter this post-Turing uh, computing uh, regime where our computers uh, may tackle application-relevant problems, but via physical methods that are not efficiently simulated by a probabilistic Turing machine. And that's quite a uh, paradigm change from the existing uh, computing technologies up until now. So that's quite exciting. And uh, these, these new physical mechanisms could lead to a comp computational uh, breakthrough for specific applications. But for quantum annealing, uh, no proof of such advantages is currently known. So in this talk, um, I'm going to talk about some innovative de designs developed by Northrop Grumman uh, that are addressing some of the central challenges for next generation quantum annealing. So uh, when looking at the design space, it can be uh, quite intimidating because there are a number of different uh, couplers and qubit properties that are conjectured to be critical. In particular, you want the coupling to be high precision, you might want it to be non-stochastic, high weight, long range, compatible with uh, high degree of connectivity, as we heard from Google. Um, simultaneously implementable, all of these different properties, potentially you'd like them all implemented at, uh, at the same time. And then uh, finally, compatible with high coherence qubits. And the designs that I'll talk about today are um, focused on that regime. And we, you might think of um, even within, uh, there are many different uh, physical systems which are proposed to implement quantum annealing. Um, with flux qubits being perhaps the, the most prominent, but even within flux qubits, you have a lot of different <laughs> you have a lot of different uh, uh, regimes in which you can design into. So, in particular, I've classified them here in terms of the critical currents of the tunable squid loop, and um, so you, it, it ranges all the way from 10 microamps in a, in a for large critical currents down to 50 nanoamps in small systems. And so, um, when you're designing different uh, uh, parameters and, and types of couplings need to be cognizant of what type of uh, qubit you're starting with and potentially that might enable um, some of these properties more than others and and uh, and, and that's actually quite uh, good because then uh, it, 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 it allows uh, different properties that, that might be um, achievable in, in one system uh, um, or whereas it's harder in different uh, systems, so it it's, uh, it's, uh, opens up the design space to have all these different regimes. So um, I'm going to talk again about a non-stochastic XX coupler as well as a weight 3 ZZZ coupler, which is uh, targeting these high coherence uh, qubit designs. So <clears throat> one of the central challenges of designing into a uh, um, a flux qubit system is that you'd like to look for non-stochastic couplings. And uh, so uh, flux qubit systems are sometimes challenged as 
as, uh, as not adequate for uh, generating uh, non-scholastic couplings. And so the general argument is as follows. So if you take a general circuit um, from circuit quantization, and here's uh, the components that you can have in such a system, capacitors, inductors, and Josephson junctions. So you can just kind of choose an arbitrary circuit and construct the, the quantum Hamiltonian. And because you just have essentially a Laplacian operator combined with a potential term, that if you try to, for instance, uh, find the ground state with um, a path integral Monte Carlo, that there is no effective sign problem uh, for such a system. So how might you get around uh, this potential bottleneck? Um, what you can do is you can add in uh, voltage bias. And so when you have adding in voltage biases into these systems, um, so let's say you have a capacitive coupling between some voltage sources and, and the nodes of your, of your system, you generate terms in your Lagrangian and ha Hamiltonian that have this non-stochastic uh, character where you have these complex phases such that it, it uh, changes the, the, effective, uh, the effective type of your Hamiltonian and your ability to implement path integral Monte Carlo. So <clears throat> how, might, uh, how might you find, a, how might you generate a non-stochastic coupling? So uh, if you just focus on an individual uh, uh, flux qubit loop in here and focus in on one given wire, and then look at a region where the two wires from two different flux qubits overlap. So uh, uh, then what you do, uh, just as we saw um, in, uh, uh, in the work of Google, that you can engineer some, uh, and D-Wave similarly, engineer some interactions in this region. How might you do it to implement an XX coupler? So simply you replace this cross crossover with a four junction ring, where the, you make all of these junctions uh, flux tunable and uh, uh, simultaneously flux tunable, and then by raising and lowering the effective critical current of these uh, junctions, you can turn on and off an, an XX coupling. So in a 2D schematic, um, this might look like a box, or if you kind of twist it around, it can also look like an air hourglass. So this uh, central unit of a four junction ring is uh, also, um, there's a lot of uh, history of this particular type of device in, in superconducting uh, technologies. In particular, it's, it's very useful for generating um, uh, amplifiers, modulators, and circulators. Um, this is, uh, Yale has extensively used it in their designs, and, and uh, a recent design from Northrop Grumman also uses this, this, uh, this, this essential topology. So it's kind of familiar from in, in design work. So it's also possible to do um, multiple uh, XX couplings for an individual cup, uh, qubit, so uh, that's great. But the real critical point is, is that when you start to add in voltage biases, you change the type of coupling. So by choosing this voltage, you can effectively choose the angle of the operator to which you are coupling. So for instance, by choosing these voltages, you can turn it from minus XX to plus XX, or indeed, you know, any X, Y, or any coupling that you, that you would like. So I um, can't really explain too much more about how this device operates, but um, you know, uh, here's a, kind of a snapshot of some of the quantum simulations that you can do of, of this device. So here's the potential, and uh, there are four separate minimums, which, which are the different uh, current states of the or flux qubits. And you can kind of, it's at least plausible that there are new tunneling paths that are being opened up between the various minimums that can kind of couple together your uh, 0, 1 and 1, 0, and your 1, 1 and your 0, 0, which is kind of the essential operation that you need to turn on an XX coupling. In particular, for realistic design parameters in this high coherence regime, you can generate couplings of order uh, 1 gigahertz in simulation. So um, that's, that's promising. So now moving on to the ZZZ coupling. So what is a ZZZ coupling? So it's when the state of one qubit changes the sign of the coupling between two other qubits. So this is a, a very important type of uh, interaction to generate because it allows native embedding of uh, three SAT problems. Um, and, uh, and just to note quickly that, uh, that three SAT problems, even on a planar graph, remain NP-hard. So uh, for our particular ZZD coupler, um, it is actually a full, fully tunable dual weight coupling, so you can choose uh, both the ZZ and ZZZ interaction strengths arbitrarily. It's ha it it uh, uses an incremental design path. In particular, it's very related to existing 
uh, coupling uh, strategies. And uh, uh, it increases the computable problem size in, um, uh, compared to use of Ancel qubits. And uh, because of that, it fundamentally alters the quantum dynamics. And uh, that may be relevant um, for systems going forward. So just to briefly discuss some of the essential challenges for, um, for design, trying to design in this high coherence regime. So again, the, the critical currents that you choose here are related to things like the uh, dephasing uh, rate or dephasing time um, because it, they alter the amount of current that is flowing in your loop. And so um, what you'd like to increase those times is to decrease this current. But there are some fundamental limits. In particular, if you're going to implement the uh, kind of the shunt loop inductance by a uh, metal trace, um, it can actually get very long. So in particular, um, to have an, uh, to, the, for when you want a, um, the Josephson inductance of a 50 nanoamp junction um, is approximate, approximately 6.6 .6 nanohenry. So just to give you an idea of the, how much metal that is, that's a, a, you know, with typical design parameters, that's longer than a centimeter. So a quite big uh, qubit. And in particular, um, when you get traces that are that long, they come with a lot of capacitance. And so um, the fundamental mode frequency begins to really drop below um, into, your, into your qubit uh, band. And so that can, that can you, there really isn't too much you can do to, to uh, go beyond this. So <clears throat> this is a problem because if you're just trying to use a, if you have to, um, if you're just trying to use a mutual inductance, um, generating coupling strengths can be uh, quite hard. If, so if you just choose a one pico Henry coupler at 50 nanoamps, you only get 3.7 megahertz of coupling. So of course, if you have larger currents, you can get larger couplings. But again, it's, it's, a, it's a fundamental challenge. So um, some of the prominent examples for, uh, in the literature for ZZZ couplers do use a number of, of mutual transformers, which uh, can, by s these type of arguments, reduce the, uh, the coupling depending on, on uh, the, uh, the, the, the strategy that you use. So instead of using uh, just geometric coupling, uh, our coupler design uses a galvanic Josephson mutual. So not just, um, not just using a galvanic mutual inductance where, two, where the coupler actually shares a trace, but um, having that trace include a Josephson junction. And by that type of methodology, you can actually increase the interaction strength and such that you get a, a, a large ZZZ coupling. And in simulations, um, the z strength of the ZZ couplings can approach uh, a gigahertz and indeed even uh, go beyond a gigahertz. So, um, yeah, so these are some of the, the coupler concepts uh, that we've developed at Northrop Grumman that uh, provide a potential path for application relevant uh, uh, post Turing computing. Thank you very much. Thank you, David. And we have time for questions. Can you give us uh, some intuition why that type of coupler give you XX coupler? Because you're still coupling uh, per persistent current, which is sigma Z, but you get XX coupler out of that. Yeah, so, um, hmm. this is perhaps a, a good slide. So, um, the way that the, the, uh, these Josephson junctions are arranged, or maybe this one is even better, it actually does not introduce a ZZ coupling just because for all these different uh, current paths, you kind of look at where they're flowing and it, they kind of cancel out in just a way when you, this kind of double balanced design. So, so, of course, that's for perfect junction symmetry, but you, know, you have to tune it to get rid of that ZZ coupling um, for when you have junction asymmetry. So uh, instead, the, the better way of, of thinking about uh, what is the physics of what's going on is, is uh, if you can really, uh, once you've kind of classified these minimums of your potential, and you can look on your circuit and you can kind of say, ah, yes, by a vortex hopping over a given Josephson junction, that kind of uh, moves you from one potential to another in your, in your potential minimum. And so really uh, what happens is, is that this kind of, um, it, it kind of introduces, uh, the, in, usually when you turn on single qubit X, you're providing a path for a vortex to hop in and out of your qubit. Okay? 
So now you provide a path to hop between your two qubits, but in particular, you do it in a way that, uh, that kind of obscures the relative orientation of your qubit. So it allows for, um, you know, for one zero to turn into zero one, the kind of intuitive way you would have a vortex hop. But it also allows zero zero to go to one one. And so that's, that's the, uh, the essential thing. So um, uh, there's a difference between realistic and real, hmm. right? <laughs> so, I mean, I'm a theorist, right? So I tend to deal with realistic. Uh, but uh, <laughs> what are your experiment plans for implementing these things experimentally? Have you done any experimental implementations? And how well does the Good. real we get to go to the, the uh, to the uh, backup slides. So <clears throat> uh, are, there, are there flux qubits or, or qubits of flux qubit type that show voltage biasing, okay? So here is a one from back in the day um, uh, in the, from the Yale group of quantronium. And here is a, a kind of your flux qubit loop. And you have one small island, which you then can voltage bias. And so you do get some tuning of the frequency of your qubit with offset charge. Here's a more recent one where the inductance of the loop is much, much larger. And it's implemented actually with a superinductance. And uh, from just uh, last year, and again, the, the matching between um, the, the theory and the simulation is actually quite good. So um, there are flux qubits that do show this, this voltage biasing type of effect. So it's promising. Um, and you know, things aren't going, you know, the coherence times aren't, you know, uh, they, are, they do go down, but it's not destroying the qubit. So I do think that there is a, a realistic path to implementing this. Um, sure. <laughs> Yeah, I, um, yeah. I just wanted to point out that in the Curio study, in fact, um, we 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 did point out that that junctions can be used to couple qubits as well as kinetic inductance. Yep. And in fact, in the extreme case, uh, we've demonstrated an inductively shunted flux qubit rather than capacitively shunted, where the inductance was between a hundred nanohenries mm -hmm. and a microhenry where um, it's a meander wire type structure. Okay. The capacitance is very small. Right. So the lowest mode is actually, you know, way above 10 gigahertz. And it's, I think there are lots of options there. Yeah, yeah, thanks. Yeah, that was for standard metal traces. If you're going with the high kinetic inductance materials, that's obviously uh, different. But, you know, there's challenges there, too. We have a question there. So um, I have a question for your ZZZ coupling. Yes. So by the time you have strong enough ZZZ coupling, how strong is your ZZ coupling and Z field? Yeah. Um, yeah, it is quite large. Uh, where did it go? Where am I? Oh, I'm at the end. That's why. Yeah. So the the ZZ coupling is actually um, in in this calculation is up to as you can see goes between minus. 40 gigahertz up to 30 gigahertz, so incredibly large. Of course, this is only realistic. I mean, um, you have to compare it to your intrinsic qubit frequency. So when you have have uh, uh, this large couplings, then you know your uh, qubit. If you're classifying it as the, the the lowest excitations of your of your qubit system, now are both within the same well. You're kind of beyond the MRT spacing. So um, a lot of those coupling strengths are, are wouldn't be where you'd be operating the qubit. Okay, so um, one, one comment uh, slash question is that uh, there's actually another path to getting non-stochastic terms, which is to allow for non-adiabatic transitions. Mm, yeah. Um, have you tried to incorporate that in your modeling? Um, so uh, yes, that is definitely within, within our modeling. Um, um, and your research group has, has been uh, at the forefront of, of, of uh, using those particular concepts to actually engineer the type of couplings that you that you would like, and uh, I think that there are there are some challenges um, um, with that route, but it's definitely uh, a leading contender. You look confused. Maybe I. No, no, no. Okay, okay. <laughs> okay. Thanks again, and.